Um, as Kate said, uh, my name is C.G. Loria. Um, I was a NASA astronaut for about nine years. And it's since uh, late 2008, I've been uh, working in uh, industry, uh, primarily in aerospace. Um, as Kate mentioned, um, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge and thank uh, uh, CU Boulder for um, hosting this event and the sponsors, uh, Digital Globe, uh, Facebook, Mapbox, Microsoft, and uh, Telenav, among others. Um, thanks also to my uh, friend and former Excel Geospatial System colleague, Josh Siskind, who's now with Digital Globe. Uh, Josh, are you in the room? He's back there somewhere, okay. Um, and uh, for asking me to, uh, to uh, come here and speak today, and also uh, Kate Chapman um, for uh, helping uh, coordinate and uh, make sure I got here on time and showed up at the right place. <laughs> um, a few things uh, strike me about um, the OpenStreetMap approach and uh, community. I was impressed both by the uh, vision and leadership of Steve Coast, who started this pioneer pioneering effort in 2004, and the diversity of the people involved and the excellence of the results. And, and that thought formed the basis of um, what I'd like to share with you today about uh, leadership and innovation. Uh, it seems to me that too often today leadership is uh, thought of as someone that larger than life, someone larger than most of us, someone that we see on, on uh, TV or media. Uh, people with names like Steve Jobs uh, and Elon Musk uh, come to mind for me. Um, people that are making news and headlines and affecting lives on, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with their vision and their innovation. I'd also like to try and point out today and share with you that leadership is a personal thing. Uh, something that occur, occurs both large uh, with, with those names and those people, uh, but also on the day-to-day -day personal scale. Uh, perhaps in your life, a leader was someone that uh, you had in college, um, someone at university. Uh, people whose passion, knowledge, and mastery of the subject inspired you and helped put you on the path to where we are today. It also occurs to me that each of you here in the room today and those of us remotely are leaders and innovators uh, because of your belief and support of achievements and participation in making OpenStreetMap successful. It really struck me how OpenStreetMap touches lives and is bit by bit changing the world. There are other maps out there that include, you know, ways to access uh, an area by foot, by car, by mass transportation, um, but the fact that OpenStreetMap is the first one I'm aware of that also has that level of detail for people with disabilities is really empowering and touching and affecting their lives on a personal level. Um, which brings me to leadership. One of the things that um, I found over the, over the years and throughout my career is the power of collaborative leadership. Um, collaborative leadership really values and embraces um, critical thought and open dialogue and diverse views and opinions. Collaboration, in my experience, works to improve and inform the major view by incorporating those dissenting views and critical thoughts um, brought by individuals involved in that process. And it thereby improves the overall solution. That resulting idea or solution is often markedly improved because a dissenting view was heard and valued instead of being marginalized and discarded. And an obvious benefit to me, to the ongoing group dynamics, whether it's at university, in corporate America, collaborating on OpenStreetMap, is that trust among the group is developed as those members feel free to brainstorm and contribute and they learn that it's safe to in inject an idea into the dynamic that might be orthogonal from where the group is coming from. A quiet leader can often facilitate an open and diverse dialogue and, and sponsor that freewheeling exchange of ideas that foster innovative solutions by listening and asking wise and well-timed questions a quiet leader can facilitate and improve brainstorming and problem-solving dynamic. Uh, let's see. Leadership examples from my experiences. 
uh, one of the ones I'd like to touch on um, is Neil Armstrong. Um, I'll come to John Glenn here in a little bit and then uh, touch on some of the fighter pots from my, uh, my days. Um, people with nicknames such as uh, Fokker, Trouser, and Shadow. Um, Neil, you might recognize him on the right there, um, from his Apollo mission. Spoke to my astronaut class in 1996. And if, uh, if you didn't know him, you might have walked right by him. He's wearing a, a polo shirt, a nice cardigan sweater, and some khaki slacks. Um, not too much different from his uh, picture there on the right. Um, after he walked on the moon, he eschewed fame in the limelight to do what was important to him, to teach, and to touch the lives of people, people that would become engineers out in industry, teaching, or engineers and scientists that I work with at NASA. He became a university professor in aeronautics at Purdue University. Um, and later, after uh, he came and spoke to our class, I corresponded, corresponded with him a bit about leadership. And what remains with me today is what a gracious and humble person Neil was. To me, um, Neil's leadership tenets remain timeless. Humility. Humility is a key attribute of establishing high trust relationships. By putting the objective, the task at hand, or mission, and team first, humble leaders can create an environment and a culture that breathes that openness and trust that I've touched on already. Also, one of his tenets was recognizing the value and contribution of others. Vigilance, focus on challenges, not problems, because those challenges often occur when one least expects them. And perseverance. Neil Armstrong and the other astronauts used the Apollo 1 tragedy, which cost the lives of astronauts Grissom, Chaffee, and White, to improve the system and Apollo that took them later to the moon. So it's that quiet leadership, the leadership of working hard, being expert in what you do, of believing in others, and sharing and living that in deeds that empowers and touches lives and changes our world for the better, bit by bit. Speaking about quiet, um, I'd like to share with you a book that I read recently. Um, it's by Susan Cain. It's called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Um, it was really a fantastic book. I've corresponded with Susan about it, talking about leadership. Um, in the book, Susan describes, in contrast, the American society and culture of about 100, 150 years ago, where really collaborative leadership was valued, as opposed to today, where it seems that the type A personality, the loudest person in the room leadership, is what's, what we most often see, at least in corporate America. The problem with that sort of type A personality leadership is that it often drives leadership by consensus. Leadership by consensus is characterized, at least in my experiences, often by seeking to marginalize divergent views and opinions until they're, the people with those views and their advocates acquiesce to the group's major view. And this inevitably damages trust and free brainstorming and limits the group from achieving in my experiences, are more optimum results. As Kate mentioned, in my early days I was a fighter pilot uh, before becoming a test pilot and going on to NASA. Um, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, being with this squadron, VMFA 314, the Black Knights, in Southern California, flying the F-18 Hornet. Um, one of the examples of leadership from that time in my life um, was uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Keith Stalder, whose call sign was Shadow. Um, and he became uh, pretty famous around the base because of his leadership style. He was a quiet leader, and we recognized him as a different kind of leader. He developed those around him not by issuing orders, but by sharing suggestions and questions. Some of the specific examples elude me now, but what I recall is that he would ask questions like, you know, you know, have you thought of this? You know, have you checked your assumptions? You know, what are other alternatives? And ultimately, 
And, and that was a leadership and kind of ongoing mentor, mentorship process that he would walk with us. And ultimately, he would ask us, what's your recommendation? And in so doing, by that collaborative and inclusive approach, he developed not only us as leaders, but together we achieved the most optimum solutions. Um, during my time with NASA, I had spent about uh, two years working at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and there, um, I worked on a number of programs there, uh, International Space Station, some of the space sh shuttle projects, um, and the uh, orbital space plane program. One of the legendary people at the Marshall Space Flight Center is this gentleman, Dr. Werner von Braun. He came to the United States after World War II. He was a German rocket scientist during the war. Um, and he's considered the father of many of the American um, uh, NASA rockets, uh, such as the Redstone rocket that put Alan Shepard uh, as the first American in space, and the Sat Saturn family rockets that were involved in the Apollo program. One of the things that um, my friends and my peers and colleagues at the Marshall Sp Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama shared with me um, was how successful uh, Dr. Werner von Braun was. Um, and I have to kind of footnote that, of course, this was obviously before PowerPoint and email, and maybe those had something to do with the fact that they were able to get so much done in such a short period of time. But, um, I mean, some of us with, with the, uh, the, the blonde to gray in our hair might remember at university chalkboards. And, and, and not just not just one chalkboard, but at, at Annapolis, there were usually three chalkboards. And the professor here, he would write on one, roll it up, and then work around the room. Dr. Von Braun and his colleagues did the same thing during the space race. And they would, they would work a challenge, and they would, they would work their way around the room on the chalkboard until they got to the solution. And then they would stand back they would write the conclusion in the agreement, and they'd sign it in chalk. And they'd stand back and take a Polaroid of the agreement and the signatures, and that was their program and documentation. And then they would continue. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty amazing, and, and that's kind of why I reference, you know, email and, and PowerPoint, because they, they achieved amazing things. Um, And some of the, the leadership characteristics that um, Dr. Werner von Braun is famous for, at least among NASA, um, is belief. Um, not only his, his belief in his own capabilities, but his confidence in his team and the fact that he let the team know that he believed in them. That in itself is empowering, um, that your peers, your supervisor, and your subordinates believe in you. Um, expertise, not only was he expert in designing a rocket engine, he was expert in systems engineering, taking the systems of systems, the hydraulics, the navigation, and putting them together to form successful rocket designs, um, which reminds me of a little story also from my days at, uh, at Huntsville. Um, has anyone here been to Huntsville, Alabama? All right. Um, it's a great place. It's a great city, um, and it actually has, I'm told, I haven't verified, but um, it has the most PhDs per capita of any city in the United States. Um, when uh, Von Braun was making the uh, Saturn V rocket, um, one of the, uh, the co-ops working with him, a, a young aerospace engineer, said, um, and you really can't see it, you can kind of see it right here on one of the, the earlier Saturn rockets, the fins. Um, the engineer said to Dr. Von Braun, he said, um, Doctor, you know, why are there still fins on the rockets? You know, based on the, on the, the, you know, the boundary layer flow and so forth, you know, there's, there's no control effectiveness for those fins on the rocket. And Dr. Von Braun said, well, he's reported saying I wasn't there. Um, he said, well, the American people expect fins on the rockets, so we give them fins on the rockets. 
so a little digress there. Um, and which kind of brings me to, he had perspective and a sense of humor. Um, and, uh, and his example, like this one, inspired the team even in the most um, challenging and stressful situations during the space race. In humility, um, among the people that I knew, know at uh, NASA Marshall, uh, he's famous for his humility and unselfishness. And he set a wonderful example and kept the team focused on the task at hand and working together. On the operations side of NASA, I had the privilege to work with a number of great people. This is the uh, uh, Space Shuttle Mission Control Center, Houston. Um, and uh, two of the uh, really wonderful uh, flight directors, or flight as we call them, uh, were, were gentlemen uh, Wayne Hale and this gentleman right here, Leroy Kane, in the flight director's position. And this is one of my old jobs over here on the right, Capcom, which is short for capsule communicator, um, harking back to the, uh, the capsule days. Um, and the whole Mission Control Center works as a team. The Capcom is the only individual that speaks to the crew on orbit, uh, and she or he is there to ensure that um, it's the right time to talk to the crew, raise any safety issues along with the rest of the team, and really bring that operational perspective to the group. Um, the, uh, and really, the, the, I mean, what people don't realize right here, but each one of these positions in Mission Control is like the tip of an iceberg. Each one of those people is speaking to a control room outside of mission control, whether, whether that's propulsion systems, GNC, guidance, navigation, and control, uh, electrical power generation, and those all feed into the representative in the front room who talks to flight. Flight runs the show. Anyways, um, these people, Wayne and Leroy, um, they were fantastic leaders. They knew their job, um, they were collaborative, they brought out the best from their team, um, both the mission control and with the shuttle team on orbit. Another NASA giant um, is uh, John Young. Um, there on the right, those of us in the room uh, from the uh, MTV days might recognize that picture. Um, he uh, flew on Gemini program, it was Apollo 10 command, service module commander, flew the Apollo lunar module on Apollo 16, and, uh, which made him the ninth person to walk on the moon. And he also flew the space shuttle. John is the only person on this planet that has piloted and commanded four different classes of spacecraft. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with John when I was at the uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. And he was the uh, special technical advisor to the uh, director of the Johnson Space Center. Um, in that role, uh, John was basically the engineering safety and mission assurance consciousness of the organization. Um, and he also exhibited that kind of collaborative leadership. Like Shadow, he would ask questions during meetings, whether it was a space shuttle program, flight readiness review, or an engineering review for the International Space Station, he would ask questions about the design, about the assumptions and constraints, and it quite often made the presenter quite uncomfortable. Um, one of the uh, friends of mine from the uh, 16th group of astronauts, uh, we would, uh, showed up and, and were trained, started training in uh, 1996. One of my classmates, Dr. Charlie Kamada, aerospace engineer from uh, NASA Langley in Virginia, started keeping an unofficial tally of how many times John asked a question and how many times he was correct. The unofficial tally by Charlie was over 93%. Um, so John, by asking his questions, by being a collaborative leader, helped make the Space Shuttle International Space Station program successful. Um, He's a fantastic individual. I got to fly with him in the NASA T-38 a number of times to meetings at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and uh, um, during one of those trips, um, I asked him about the, uh, the old days, you know, the, the original days. Um, and he, uh, he shared a vignette about uh, 
um, him and his, his friend and peer, Gus Grissom. And he said that, uh, you know, back then, most of the training that's now at Houston was at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and so they, most of the astronauts had Corvettes in those days, not so much anymore. Um, and he said, well, yeah, you know, we were here, out here for training, and old Gus, he asked me to, you know, carpool with him to work one day. And uh, he said, I didn't know it, but Gus tried to set a new land speed record from the hotel to the sim building every day. <laughs> he said, that was the last time I carpooled with old Gus. And, um, and actually, my, my flying nickname or call sign is Gus after Gus Grissom. So I asked John, I said, well, you know, what was he like? And uh, he said, old Gus, he was the best test pilot I ever saw. Um, so just uh, John's a tremendous individual. Um, and I can't say enough good things, things about him and about his leadership. Um, today I'm a uh, senior program manager with this organization, uh, Draper Laboratory out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's a fantastic organization. I'm proud to be a part of it. Um, and the, uh, I'm a senior program manager, and we're building the uh, uh, Byzantine fault-tolerant, high-performance single-board computers that will be the, the uh, flight computers for NASA's Dream Chaser spacecraft and the flight software that's going to make the vehicle fly. The Dream Chaser is being built right here in Colorado by the amazing people over at uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, or SNC's Space Systems Division in Louisville, Colorado. The Dream Chaser, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The Dream Chaser is an innovative lifting body that by itself is capable of providing all logistics up and down mass to the International Space Station. It uses all non-toxic propellants. It, because of its a lifting body on return to Earth, it has a low G flight profile with a maximum 1.5 Gs, making it the only vehicle that can bring back delicate biological experiments from the ISS. A little bit about uh, Doc Draper, who Draper Lab is named after. Um, in case you didn't grow up around MIT like I did, where my parents were on faculty. Um, Doc Draper is considered the father of inertial navigation systems um, that were ultimately used in the Apollo uh, missions. Um, and he was a hardworking and innovative individual. His leadership was characterized by focus, total involvement, energy, and self-confidence. Knowing your people and team. He, Doc Draper was also famous for knowing just about everyone's first name at Draper Lab. Attention to detail. Um, and this was key to his successful development of developing the rate gyro, which made that autonomous navigation possible. And Doc Draper's qualities of hard work, vision, innovation, quality engineering continue today at Draper Lab. Which brings me to innovation. Before I share with you about innovation, I think it's important for us to talk about diversity. Um, and maybe in a way that, that some of you haven't thought about before. It seems surprising to me uh, that many smart people fail to see and appreciate and understand the importance of diversity um, and the dramatic benefits it has to innovation in a growing and learning organization. The benefits include increased creativity, a diversity of ideas and viewpoints can lead to creative breakthroughs. A company or organization made up of employees from diverse ethnic backgrounds, generations, genders, races, and religions brings a more creative energy and diversity of thought than one finds in a more homogeneous organization. That leads to richer brainstorming. That diversity of opinions, ideas, and input can lead to more productive discussions, and I contrast that with an environment where everyone's opinions mirror each other, um, and that has a high probability of producing stagnant results. And in the end, the achievement is better decision making. Diverse perspectives lead to better decisions for your company, your employees, and your customers. Two quick examples. Now it's time for the slide. Um, 
And we're, this is a, a view of the uh, service module from Apollo 13. Who here has seen the movie Apollo 13? All right, well, I've, thank you. I've met some of the astronauts, Jim Lovell and the others, um, and I've met some of the team at uh, NASA that worked this mission. The, the flight directors, engineers, technicians, and managers, they sought, they needed, they had to have a diversity of thought and inputs in order to successfully bring these astronauts home. That saved the lives of Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes. Those people on the NASA team innovated. They used their, their collaborative decision making to address the challenges and were wonderfully successful. Now for something not too successful. This is Challenger. January 1986. There are a number of engineers involved in the program that tried to raise the issue that this was below the, the design temperature limits for the system of systems. In particular, the O-rings on the solid rocket boosters. Solid rocket boosters at that time were built by Morton Thicol and they were assembled in four parts. And in between, each segment was two O-rings and that kept the hot burning gases from the solid rocket boosters from escaping. Unfortunately in this example they didn't use collaborative decision making. They drove leadership by consensus. Those inputs to try and tell flight and NASA to delay the not launch were not put forward. Okay, fast forward something in my background, the orbital, sp orbital space plane program. Um, in innovation, it's surprising how a good idea always seems to kind of percolate to the top and come forward. The orbital space plane, or OSP, was to provide um, emergency crew return and emergency logistics such as food, water, and supplies to the National Space Station. Ultimately, NASA canceled the orbital space plane program it later developed the Constellation program where I was the first deputy chief engineer at NASA headquarters, which then morphed into the um, Space Launch System, or SLS, with its heavy expendable rockets and Orion crew module that's being produced today by NASA. So if you look at some of these designs, like on the top left, the lifting body, we actually built the cockpit for that. I helped design that, the crew space, and we tested it aboard uh, NASA's zero-G aircraft, which flew, flies a series of parabolas to test the, the crew station and emergency egress. And at least among the astronauts, our nickname for the uh, zero-G aircraft was the Vomit Comet. Um, anyways, it was great, great work, a lot of innovation. Um, so remember that top left, this is what's being built today in Colorado. This is Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser spacecraft. It was originally a crewed version. They weren't selected by NASA. SNC believed in their design. They invested in it. They kept it alive. And then it recently won NASA's Commercial Resupply Services II contract. And this is what we're building the flight computers and flight software for. It's being built right down the road in Louisville, Colorado. Um, it's a lifting body. It features uh, in the back there the gray unpressurized logistics volume. It has some logistics on the outside, solar powered. The aerosurface actuators are let, moved by electrical motors. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually it's having a, uh, a drop test or a flight test out at uh, NASA Armstrong in California uh, this month. It's really an incredible design um, and it's something that uh, it's a privilege to be a part of. Um, so that, I guess that's my uh, example of innovation and how good ideas come forward the importance of leadership, 
the importance of team um, and a collaborative approach in diversity. Those things are of incredible value. Um, and when I was researching OpenStreetMap and what's been done, that's what struck me. And that's why I chose to, to share these thoughts with you today. Um, in closing, I'd like to take a few seconds to acknowledge uh, some of the people from my past um, who've uh, helped me professionally, such as NASA's John Young, uh, my first boss on the Constellation program at NASA, Dan Dumbacher, Lieutenant General George Troutman from the uh, National Science Foundation, Liz Blood, my two deputies down the street from here at uh, NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, Dr. Charlotte Rehm and uh, Kirsten Reeves, um, the leadership team at Draper, and SNC's uh, Steve Lindsay and John Curry, who were also with me at NASA. Um, thank you for your time today. You've, you've been wonderful. Um, at this time, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Yes. You mentioned collaborative leadership on Apollo versus uh, consensus leadership on Challenger. How are they different? Um, great question. The, the um, collaborative approach, um, in my experience, really values um, critical thought, whether it, it, it's, it's part of the majority group position um, or something different. Um, you know, in my experience, it's often the orthogonal, you know, coming from you know, the 90 degree viewer opinion that, that could be a game changer. Um, whereas, you know, leadership by consensus too often seeks to marginalize some of those divergent views in a desire to, to achieve maybe a quicker solution. Um, and you, you lose that, that value, that contribution. An example, um, we were working on maintenance for International Space Station. In, in zero G, um, quite often simple things become challenging. Something as simple as drilling a hole. Um, in space, you can't have, you know, those filings that here in 1G would, you know, lay on the surface. Those filings, whether fiber or metal, are going to float around, potentially get in your eye, be inhaled, or float behind a panel and possibly create a short circuit. Uh, so this was something we, we were trying to tackle and challenge. Um, the majority group view was to develop some sort of encasing box, you know, with, with a vacuum attachment, um, and that, that would have worked. It was also kind of cumbersome. Uh, one of my astronaut peers, uh, Frank Caldero, said, well, use shaving cream. <laughs> the group was like, what? Be quiet, Frank. Um, and Frank, luckily, Frank persisted. He said, no, really, use shaving cream. So I, one of the people in the room turned to Frank and said, you know, what are you talking about? He said, well, I built my own airplane. And to keep the shavings from, you know, getting all over the workspace or blowing around, he took regular shaving cream, sprayed it on the site, drilled, and the cream itself and the tension of the bubbles in the liquid embedded the filings in it so that when the, when the job was done, you just wiped it up. And that's what's being used on ISS. <laughs> so you can have the complicated approach with a box and a seal and a vacuum attachment, or you can use shaving cream. Yes. Uh, my question is, was it scented or unscented or <laughs> no? <laughs> no. Uh, Probably unscented. <laughs> as uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but every April tax time rolls around mm -hmm. and my husband and I aren't smart enough not to pay taxes. Yeah, I haven't figured so, that one out yet either, but. <laughs> so. Your presentation made uh, paying the taxes more palatable since uh, this is what our government funds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Anyone else? Uh, sir, what was your first aircraft that you flew on? Uh, first aircraft? Uh, yes, sir. Um, in, in flight training, um, that would have been the um, T-34 Charlie Turbo Mentor. It's since been retired because I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great airplane. I've flown about 32 aircraft, 32 aircraft including uh, everything from the Goodyear Blimp um, to the uh, Mirage 2000 um, to a MiG. How is it moving from in the airplane where you have direct control to the more modern fly-by-wire system where there's this layer between you and c the control? It was, um, thanks, the, uh, it was pretty seamless. Um, in, the, uh, in the F-A-18, um, they used uh, different things to give you the feel um, that you were physically connected to the, the aero surfaces. They, they would put a weight on the bottom of the stick so that under G you'd get feedback. They also used springs, um, and that, that gave you the, the tactile feedback. Um, but then the, the digital flight computers, um, they're just magic. They, um, they, they enable you, at least, especially in the F-18, I've flown the F-15, the F-16, um, Mirage, MiG, um, they enable you to use your, depending on the situation, what gray matter you have left um, on the task at hand. So whether that's you know combat, landing aboard the aircraft carrier, um, it, it's really an, an amazing system. Um, space shuttle use fly-by-wire. Um, and actually, in, in the space shuttle, the, uh, they use rotational hand controllers. Um, your hands off for, for launch, if a problem happened on launch and you had to go hands on, as opposed to the F-16, where the, the, the controller is pivoted at the bottom, on the space shuttle, the pivot points in the middle of the handle, so that under the acceleration of launch, where you're one, two, to a maximum of three Gs, uh, going you know, from front to back, when, when the astronaut, when she or he, would take manual control, the weight of your hand and the pull of the G wouldn't induce a pitch moment to the vehicle. So again, just kind of brilliant design. Um, so thank you. Hi there. Um, I was wondering, so you, you have a perspective of um, the Earth from above, you know, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how geospatial, like spatial analysis may, may like how it um, uh, influenced your experience, how you use a map, um, and you know, potentially like what a collaborative map looks like for you more. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, uh, I mean, as, as, as a pilot, I've, I've been kind of a consumer <laughs> of uh, MAP and MAP products for um, quite a long time. The, um, you know, for me, the, as, as a user on that level, you know, the accuracy um, is critical. Um, and uh, the, the availability of it and the interaction, at least within an aircraft or spacecraft, the seamless interaction with the other systems, navigation, guidance, and so forth. Um, and that was critical from, from my, my career. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, what, what strikes me about what, what you're achieving here is the collaborative kind of grassroots approach contributing, enriching that map um, in a myriad of ways. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Anyone? Do and I like that it, maybe I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably you took a commercial flight yesterday I did. to join us. 
As someone who's flown so many aircraft, does anything go through your mind when you're, you know, not in the driver's seat? Um, no, I, you know, I love flying. I like flying a lot more when I'm up in the office in front with the view. <laughs> but um, no, it's just, it, it's, you know, it, it's amazing. The, uh, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, t talking about in innovation um, and technology, and I'll kind of take the question and take it off me and kind of put it on um, my paternal grandfather. Um, he was born in San Jose, Costa Rica, um, came to the U.S., um, worked in Boston. Um, he was born in the late 1800s. Um, so during his lifetime, um, he saw, you know, steamships, powered human flight, you know, two world wars, the atomic age, and space flight. Um, you know, the, you know what, what we've seen, the, the technolo technological changes and advances just in commercial air transportation in, in my lifetime is pretty remarkable. You know, there, there's companies like um, Boom Aero down in Denver that are working on a, a supersonic uh, transport, kind of a, a evolved form of the uh, Concorde uh, supersonic transport. Um, there's other companies that are working on the same thing. So the future is pretty interesting. It's, it, it, it's pretty bright, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what comes next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Um, Thank you. I'm so excited you could join us. A round of applause.